Okay, let us start the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen. Such nice people. Yes. Well, I think this is our final discussion for the evening, and we, we will follow on from Rodrigo's um, uh, theme, widen it to the dollar, and ask the question, is the role of the dollar assured? I think Jens has already nailed the issue, pretty much nailed the issue, the euro isn't going to deplace the dollar. I think we have basically established that. And Rodrigo has also said the one is not going to do that either. So we've kind of answered the question and can have dinner right now. Uh, well, well, actually not. We, we could actually go long term and ask yourself, in the short term, it's not going to happen. It's very, very clear. We, 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 yeah, we, obviously, there's more to be said than we did. And we can do this, and I, I invite the panel to do this. I have in my role as a journalist, I have three questions to the panel. They, they're free to answer them, all of them or none of them. It's, all, it's, up to, it's up to the panel. The first question I have is, is the use of our currencies, and this is a long-term question, not, nothing I expect to happen in the first in the next decade. Is the, is the use of our currency as coercion, geopolitical coercion instruments for sanctions, we've frozen Russian uh, foreign reserves, um, which is a kind of a default. You know, obviously, uh, we don't phrase it as that, but obviously the idea of a reserve is not, not for that not to happen. Um, is the use of financial sanctions, dollar-based sanctions, the, the use of secondary sanctions on other legislatures, um, Congress passing a law that other countries have to follow or else their banking systems will be staved, starved of the dollar thing. Is this going to be a factor that will influence the dollar, uh, the dollar's role as a global currency? Uh, my second question is, to which extent could, can the BRICS countries establish a currency arrangement among each other for the trade, uh, their own bilateral or multilateral trade, obviously not for any trade they have with the United States, but for, a, you know, if Brazil and India were to trade, can they not achieve a, a, a route this trade outside of the, out of the dollar network? And my third question is, if I can remember this, my third question. We can, start, we can start with the two first, then you can Oh, yeah, well, I have yeah. a third question. <laughs> My third question is about cryptocurrencies. Now, yes, again, sir? can, you know, we always talk about dollar, yen, euros, and all the stuff we know, but are there, are there possible technical and, and sort of technical innovations coming up in the future? And the cryptocurrencies exist already. I'm not talking about Bitcoin specifically, but is it possible that there is a technical innovation that we, that we do things differently? It's like sort of a sea change, like, you no know, the, 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 the way... You know, there's certain, you know, something out that happens sort of outside the box of, of our sort of, of our present monetary financial system that make us not use the dollar as much as, as it is. Three, obviously, things that only happen in the long run, so it's not about, you know, something that will, will, will change the world. If you come back in 10 years, it probably won't have happened by then. But um, just a thought. Can I? Okay. Starting off with the project. So, very simple. The power to issue currency is political power. Many people here are against the euro. Why are they against the euro? Because they want the political power to be in the hands of Italy. They don't want the political power to be in the hands of the ECB. The idea that cryptocurrencies will replace national or international currencies means that countries will voluntarily give away their power. This is not going to happen. The, the, the head of Binance has pleaded, pleaded guilty to financial misdeeds because they just learned that lesson. The United States will not give away its power to issue the global currency voluntarily. Yes, 
in the long run, cryptocurrencies may come up with innovations that people, but again, the idea that governments will not prosecute citizens that use other currencies in their soil is a figment of imagination. Again, monetary sovereignty is, in an essence, about political power. And we are seeing that in this um, event. You want, many people here don't want the euro because they want another, they want a change in political power. In a way, it's as simple as that. Brigitte? Yeah, and so I'm a monetary economic, so I really don't see it as simple as that. <laughs> um, money is about trust, I agree. Uh, but if it was so easy as you want to be the global money, and because you want it, you have it. Well, probably we will not be here today because we'll, we'll have the lira, I will have the franc, I will be very happy. The Brits here, he will still have the pound sterling as a man for an exchange. The US will not have the dollar. It just happened that somehow, at one point, there is some event in history, which means that you don't want any more of this currency. In the case of the pound sterling, it just happened that suddenly the trade, the world war, all kind of events, means that he was replaced by the US currency. And the US currency can be replaced. And yep. it can be replaced, why? Because people are fed up with all those sanctions. Because money is based on trust. And if suddenly you are using a currency and you know that you have a nice woman like Janet Yellen declaring, sorry, we put another sanction on you. Are you really going to use it without trying to develop or to use another currency? I don't think so. Just, just to come back, just a second, Jens. Just to come back. But my story is not incompatible with what you're saying. If money is power, what we are discussing is the political power of the US. Yes, if the world revolts and wants to take away that political power of the US, sure, yeah. we're going to find we're going to find another currency. But I do not see a global coordination that will make that happen anytime soon. No, that's right. No, global coordination is not the question. That, that is yeah. indeed the case. Uh, Jens. So I'll, I'll answer the first question. <laughs> okay. So you asked, OK, what happens when you put um, sanctions on a country when you confiscate their reserves, right? So we're talking about several, several hundred billion dollars worth of Russian reserves that were confiscated, of which a big part was in Europe, another big part was in dollars. And this is controversial. This, uh, you would argue this never actually happened before this way. The, the reserves that were confiscated in, in past were uh, under, under different circumstances. It's never really happened with a big country like that. So it's a big thing. And um, this is what I do day in and day out. Exante Data, we advise uh, clients, including central banks, on how they manage their currency exposures. And we got millions of questions, right? OK, what's going to happen to the dollar now? Is the dollar implode now? They have ruined the credibility of the dollar, right? And the data is crystal clear, right? Since that decision was taken, right, the invasion was February 24 and uh, 22, right? And uh, the reserve uh, confiscation happened shortly thereafter. We have certainly not had a weak dollar, right? Everybody can just look at the Bloomberg or whatever they get their prices from. And the dollar has been incredibly strong. We can look at the composition of reserves. I show the, the euro share going down. The counterpart of that is that the dollar share has been very stable. Uh, so really what's happened is that there's been some leakage out of euros and a little bit of move into some smaller currencies. So people have not gone somewhere else. But I think this is really the key point. A lot of people don't like the dollar. But where do they go? Right? And um, we had a good presentation on China that showed, OK, the Chinese currency is not a freely floating currency. I analyze capital flows every day, every week, right? I just sent out a report this morning that look what happened last week. We had another week where foreign investors are selling Chinese bonds. Okay, over the last year, how many of those have, weeks have we had? 
just around 52 <laughs> in the last yeah. year. It is a very, very persistent trend, right? Nobody wants Chinese currency exposure. And uh, this is hugely important, right? Mm. Because if it was the situation where people didn't like the dollar and it was obvious where they were going to go, then we can have a big change. But it is impossible to find alternatives, right? So I'll just make a final point. That doesn't mean that the dollar is going to be invincible forever. So it could come in two ways. It could become under threat because there is an alternative. Maybe China eventually will get their financial system under control, have an open capital account, and be an alternative. Not a prediction, I'm just saying as a possibility. It is. Maybe things will change in Europe, the euro will become an alternative. It doesn't look like it at this point <laughs> in time. <laughs> but the other way is through a kind of suicide. That is true. So we have to think about how the US can inflict <laughs> enough pain yep. on its own that even if it's really hard to find alternative, alternatives <laughs> will be found, right? And the key statistic there, and this is very interesting, like we discuss in Europe, should we have a 10, excuse me, a 3% of GDP deficit limit, right? So in the United States, the trend in the deficit is just around 7% of GDP. And now, because interest rates have risen from roughly zero to something that is closer to four or five, the interest rate expense in the US budget is going to go from one and a half percent of GDP to roughly three and a half in a couple of years. So if nothing else happens, you can argue that the deficit is going to drift toward nine percent of GDP. These are not small numbers, right? And I look at the market every day, and there's one thing that happened in the last couple of weeks that is very scary. And I'm not saying the world has changed, <laughs> but it's starting to smell like something is changing. And that is that the US government has a hard time selling its long-term bonds. Yep. Mm -hmm. And exactly. it goes back to what we heard about with this truth, with Rodrigo mentioning, right? When they elected a prime minister in the United Kingdom, had a populist program that had uh, essentially reckless tax cuts, I think we can say that. They were just too aggressive for anybody to believe they were realistic. Uh, the bond market didn't like it, and she was out of a job within days. We know about the salad uh, thing that lasted longer than her, right? Um, in the US, we've just started to have auctions that, I wouldn't say failed auctions, right, but you issue a 30-year bond, and then in the la next couple of hours, the bond yield raises, you know, 20 boys, basis point in a couple hours. That's scary stuff. So I'm not saying we're on the suicide path, right? But we're on a path in the US where the fiscal deficits are enormous. There's literally no political uh, debate about doing anything about it. Uh, and the bond market is starting to sniff that this is an issue. So yeah. that's yeah. the path to worry about. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's certainly, certainly the case that uh, I think the panel is probably in agreement that we're not in a situation where the dollar will soon be replaced by another currency. There's no, no uh, likelihood of this. But I, I would agree with Brigitte that m money is, I mean, the secret in, in economics is nobody really understands money. Uh, you know, the, the physicist always said that no one understands, or was it Richard Feynman, is that no one understands quantum mechanics. Money is a similar thing in, in, in economics, and we have, you know, people have very different views and interpretations of it. Um, I'm, you know, I, so, I, I agree with Brigitte's view of money as a, as a social contract. It was very much out of the, the French philosophy idea that it isn't something like, you know, I don't, I don't see it primarily as a state power thing, as a political thing, but it is ultimately uh, a, a thing of tr that we trust, we choose to trust it or we choose not to trust it. And if we all sat down and said we choose to trust another, another money, then we do that and, you know, states could be powerful, uh, powerless. And we should also not extrapolate, th you know, constraints we had in the past, constraints that led to dominance of one currency only. There were reasons mm -hmm. why there were only ever one currency, but that was not to do because that is a natural state of affairs. It is to do with the fact that uh, you know, we had technological constraints. There were network effects that benefit the fact that there was a sterling, then later it was the dollar. And who knows what's going to happen, what's going to, what's going to happen uh, um, uh, afterwards. 
Roberto, any, any further comments on what you've just heard? No, for sure. This is <coughs> what you just described is the Argentinization of the US. This is, this is literally how that crisis happened. You have a lack of trust. You don't, people don't wanna buy bonds anymore, right? What happened in the UK, if it happens in the US, that's how the US goes into an inflation spiral. That's how people stop using the US. Now, again, we, we talk about those things as if all other Asians are passive. But what would happen in that unlikely scenario? It's likely that the Fed would increase interest rates. And the idea that people will not want to buy bonds with interest rates that are higher than five, let's say seven or eight, it, it starts becoming inconceivable. But yes, that's, that's what happens. I don't know if people notice, uh, but that is, a uh, government just literally is trying that right now, is, is Turkish. The Turkish government just increased interest rates to 40%. Why? Again, for the same reason. Why is it likely to fail? Because there is no agreement on a fiscal package. Again, it's, it's, what, it's what Latin American countries have gone through to get out of hyperinflation. You have to create trust, which is power and trust are intertwined. You have to create trust by showing that the, that trajectory is sustainable. And it's, that trajectory is sustainable. You can now start issuing bonds and stop using money to finance the deficit. So I think that at, at the end, when people are talking about, oh, the US is printing trillions of dollars. If you look at the balance sheet of the Fed, the Fed is right now destroying dollars because that's what high interest rates are. You increase interest, rate by, you increase interest rates by destroying dollars. That is the main risk, and, and, and I agree with you very much. The main risk of the US dollar is a death by suicide. Right now, there is no other viable path for a decrease in um, the power of the global currency, which is uh, right now is still the greenback. You know, I, j I just want to go back to just what you said about, you know, and to go back to what Jan said about the U.S. just have to increase its interest rate, yeah, by two points or whatever. Do you remember 1981? See, 20. Yeah. So we are not even in the same situation as 1981. We had 44 people countries that defaulted in 1981, yeah? So just imagine the US decide to rise by two percentage points, for instance. Have you seen the level of debt in France or in Italy, yeah? So maybe that time, the debt crisis we will face will not be only an emerging market one, but it will really be truly global. So I don't think somehow that today we are in a situation where the U.S. is completely free to just increase interest rate, just like that. I don't know, probably Jan has different ideas. Well, so um, the, the difference from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago is very simple. We just have way more debt, right? The only other time in history that the U.S. had any kind of debt of this level was right after the Second World War, yeah. very special yeah. circumstances. Yeah. So uh, we can learn about it in the first year in economics, right? There's something called a budget constraint. Yeah. And then um, the question is when it becomes binding. And clearly we're closer to it becoming binding than we have seen for a long time. And that's going to have implications. And it's especially going to have implications, right, because we have in the United States is totally, frankly, completely dysfunctional politics. You can, you Not can, only. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can look at the list that we have, as I said, 7% of GDP deficit, 
you look at the, um, the key focus items of the political debate, it's about what should the textbooks look like in school. Uh, there's some immigration issues like fiscal deficit is number 11 on the list. It's not even being debated, right? Gosh. So the discussion about it has not started. So uh, the way it's going to work is that the bond market is going to start the discussion. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> how it always works. So, I mean, if, 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 if Argentina switches to dollars, the U.S. obviously has no, no one to switch to. But we're just saying, I mean, to, we're talking about this, the, the regime, you know, the death by suicide or the, the, the death of the dollar by suicide. This is not so, and I, I'm just, you know, asking this question. This is not so, so, so un, you know, I mean, look, if you're looking at the, at the trajectory of U.S. politics ahead, there is an election coming up in less than 12 months whose outcome is, shall we say, uncertain. You know, we would not have thought a year ago when there were the midterm elections, when everybody agreed that Donald Trump was finished, that there was, you know, DeSantis was the, the, big, the, big, the big new guy. He deflated within a few months. Trump is back. He may not be the candidate. He may not win if he is the candidate. Uh, he may be a different Trump if he governs and wins <laughs> and governs. But unlikely. Um, in a situation where American society convulses, where NATO convulses, is, would we not already be in that scenario maybe in 24 months' time? We, so a history lesson to, to answer that question in a roundabout way. I'm going to answer the question. Is people don't remember, let me, let me the, you, you know this very well for sure. So Paul Volcker single-handedly decided to increase interest rates by 50, five, 500, 600, 700 basis points. And one thing that, and it destroyed the financial system, it destroyed Latin America. The US can do it again because the political price that they paid was and people are not going to remember this, not only a financial crisis, but farmers blockaded Washington. They brought trucks because when interest rates went to 20%, it destroyed farmers because farmers couldn't borrow money anymore. And they blockaded Washington. That's the, in a way, that was not that different from a suicide, political suicide, but that was what Paul Volcker did. Can this happen again? Of course it can. The US can increase interest rates and inflict a lot of pain and destroy the global economy, which is very scary, but that is the power that the mighty dollar has. Again, we don't have the counterbalance. And again, the story of Paul Volcker is simple. It is no different than today. It's exactly what you said. During the 70s, the, the central bank kept interest rates low because Congress was supposed to do contractionary fiscal policy. The idea was Congress will finally do austerity and we're going to see the, the end of stagflation of the 70s. And Congress never did. And because Congress never did, Paul Volcker increased interest rates all the way to 20%. This can happen again. But yes, the problem is that now, it's not Latin America that is gonna be destroyed. It is Europe. Because that is so high. And that's why you are afraid. When it's us Brazilians, nobody cares, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, but it's true. But now people are scared with good reason. But don't fool yourselves. What you're describing is a really realistic scenario. The central bank would increase interest rates to 10, 12, 13%, no matter the pain that would befall the rest of the world. The idea that the US cannot do that because, no, if the US rises study, interest rate should 13%, everybody will flock to American public debt exactly like they did in 1980 and 1981. And that is very, very scary. 
and he asked that that would explode. Then again, who wouldn't, who wouldn't bet on getting 13%? I have a friend who just retired and part of his income was the 20% a year bonds that uh, his husband bought in 1982 that vested in 2022. He was, he made the right bet. And I wouldn't bet against Janet Yellen if she wants to increase, or not Janet Yellen, um, I wouldn't bet against the, 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 the Fed if they want to increase interest rates to 15%. I think the Fed will win, even if it destroys the whole world. But what if the Fed doesn't increase the interest rate to 15%? The U.S. government keeps on making deficits of seven to ten percent year in, year out, and uh, you know we see a different, uh, yes. different scenario. But that is a, that is another scenario. Yes. So obviously, what what often matters in these situations is what the real interest rate is, right? So yeah. um, we we obviously have a situation where the, the Fed has uh, been fighting the inflation problem and. It looks like they're getting the situation under control, but I'll just go back to what I said, right? We have never had this level of debt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the budget situation will be impacted by raising interest rates in a way we have not experienced before. And that's gonna have some uh, interesting consequences for sure. Uh, and that's, that's why we can't compare. I'll just give you, um, since my job is to forecast currencies in Exante data on data day basis, I'll just give you kind of like a fact. Mm -hmm. When you look around the world, right, there's some countries that have very high debt and there are some countries that have much lower debt. Mm -hmm. Like so for example, I, actually the reason I studied economics is that when I grew up in the 70s, 80s, Denmark was bankrupt. Denmark had 100% of G GDP debt to GDP. Now they have almost no debt, right? So there's some countries that are different trajectories. But what's interesting when you look around uh, global markets is that actually the countries that have very low debt, you cannot see it in their asset performance. You cannot see it in their equity markets. You cannot see it in their currencies. <laughs> so what does that tell you? I think that tells you that investors around the world for some reason don't believe that we are close to the budget constraint yet. Mm -hmm. Rightly or wrongly, but I'm just saying what you yeah. see in the market. Yeah, yeah. And I think the big transition we're gonna have in the next couple of years is that eventually investors will come to the conclusion exactly. that it does matter, but it's not priced yet. Right. Yeah. I agree, it's not priced yet. And again, it's, it's impossible to, to, to price because what is the scenario? You're gonna price in which currency? Right? If you're, if you're not pricing in, in, in a bond yield to the treasury, which is the risk-free rate, you're going to price it how? Yeah, but you, so, the, so we, we're in Italy, right? So we have a neighbor that's called Switzerland here, right? <laughs> si, si. So Switzerland is actually a place where the currency is very strong, very little debt, obviously. Switzerland is totally different, right? So there you can see it. So Switzerland is the example of, okay, people are paying for the sway, safety of Switzerland. What I'm saying, if you look around the world and you look at places like Australia, those types of economies where they also have very little debt, it has not been priced like no. Switzerland yet. And I think it will eventually happen like that. I agree. That's interesting. These are not good scenarios that we are actually discussing. No? I mean, if you look at the various adjustment scenarios that have, I mean, very high interest rates that throw the, the developing world into crisis or this adjustments budget constraint idea or you know, the idea that we are basically hitting debt levels in Europe very soon. So it, it would suggest that a, a some kind of a singularity, crisis, crash, something of that na nature will, a correction if you want to just be very neutral in, in our language, uh, uh, is likely to occur within a foreseeable period. This is no longer this, oh, I don't know when it will happen, but uh, this is now, we'll, we're, we're talking about foreseeable, you know, investor relevant time horizons for this, no? There, there seems to be a, a reasonable degree of... <laughs> no, that is, that is one <laughs> way out. Growth solves all problems. It does. <laughs> so if the world economy returns to growth and it grows like it did in 2010, yeah. all that we are discussing fall by the wayside, debt levels go down, everybody's happy, 
Spain goes to Latin America to ask for workers again, but uh, that probability is not that high yeah, at the we moment. We're entering the season of hope now yeah, with Christmas. Yeah, we have that. Season, so yeah, we, ha uh, we have some hope. Yeah. We have some hope. I mean, that is indeed the, the point of growth is the uh, one percentage, gr percentage growth of, of growth for, for Italy, France, or Germany would solve all problems. So that is absolutely clear. Yeah. We would not have these discussions that we are having. Uh, the US has a different problem. Uh, the growth is currently doesn't appear to be or is, is the growth mainly, the, the growth we have mainly just, I mean, it's 7% deficit, you know. Yeah, that you would expect some growth, and if you have keeping that in year in, year out, I mean, the, you would, some of that would stick. No? It's not like, uh, if they had the same fiscal policies as we did, they'd probably have the same growth rates as we did. No? Yeah. Or would that be a different? Uh, if you look at the CBO, CBO is the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, which is an independent uh, institution inside the Congress in the US. The deficit is supposed to narrow um, because growth is increasing revenue. Mm -hmm. So it is supposed to be 4%, it's supposed to be 3 and um, in two years. But yes, here's, here's the problem. The US is counting on this kind of level of growth which doesn't exist in Europe, continuing. Which is, that may be the inflection point. Yeah. What happens if the Ameri American economy goes into a hard recession, then we don't know. Yeah. Finally, my final question to the panel is, we have all discounted the euro. Um, are there scenarios in which any of you think that the euro could at some point emerge. I mean, we always said theoretically this is possible. But um, we'd said this in 1999. I remember there were a number of academics who wrote about the euro as a potential uh, uh, world currency, and the scenarios that they described did not occur. Um, and what would need to happen for this to happen? Or are we basically already resigned to accepting that it won't? So I'll just go back uh, to what I did in my presentation earlier, right? So lots of books have been written about what is yeah. needed to have a mm. sound, strong, stable currency, right? And uh, fiscal transfer, as everybody knows about, is a pretty important part, right? So we had sort of a, some, uh, should we call it fiscal transfers by accident because yeah. of the COVID uh, shock, and that created a special political situation. But the long-term situation is that it's very hard to imagine that we're going to have very large fiscal tra transfers with the group of countries that is in the euro now. Okay. Right. So um, if the eurozone was reconstituted in a way where it was <laughs> easier to get those uh, transfers uh, agreed to, that would be a different situation. But it's quite hard to imagine that the current equilibrium evolves into something where those transfers yeah. become very large from a long-term perspective. Bridget? Yeah, I, th I think to answer this question, maybe we should go back to why, how the euro has been created to the history of the thing. I mean, you, you had this fundamental um, lack of translation or misunderstanding between two countries, the German and the French, or maybe they understood each other very well, but nobody else. What I mean here is that you had a president called Mitterrand who thought he wanted to be the last president of France and he succeeded. He knew very well that monetary sovereignty was you know, the only way to lead a country. And at the same time, he thought, brilliant, I have a bargaining with the German because they want reunification. So the deal is the following. Uh, we reunify, we accept. And the German Central Bank, who has this wonderful reputation, is going not only to put down the inflation rate in France, but also helping us to finance whatever deficit we decide to yeah. have. So th that was the kind of reason, the political reason that was evoked before. Whether now, as, as Jan said, you know, we can really establish something on this foundation, I very much doubt it because nothing has very much changed. The French are still a huge budget deficit. 
and they will blame Italy or whatever country. The German, until recently, have used Hyundai concert plus that has taken, been taken care of somehow. But it's basically two countries following their own rules and asking all the others to just be good guy and to accept the euro, but I don't see any motor to really make it a successful. Uh, there's no, I don't see any discussion about really making monetary and fiscal policy yeah. far from it. Can I ask you a question uh, on this one, just a follow up? Do you think it should happen? Do you think, I mean, just, just in terms of. Do you, you think know, what? Do you think it should happen? Do you think the Europeans? Should try, should should try to to change the parameters uh, such that the euro can become a, 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 a at least a stronger and even currency to the dollar, or should we not prioritize that at all? I personally, I don't think we should prioritize that. Okay, so it's not it's, it's, you were saying it's not going to happen, and we should not I, make it I'm happen. Just, I'm just okay, no, that's no, fine. It's just, <laughs> Clear. I mean, the Germans always took that view, by the way. The old Bundesbank took the view that we should not prioritize the global currency because that would allow us, that would actually weaken our, determine, our ability to control prices and you know, the, the, the kind of method that they, or the kind of world view that they had, would have been, you know, a geopolitical euro was not in their, in their plan. Uh, the Americans now manage these things much better than we do. Look at what is happening right now in Germany. Do you think it's not going to have any consequences with the French? Deficit? Absolutely, absolutely. This yeah, is, I mean, the, Germans, the shocking thing about the Germans, I didn't say this in, the, in our conversation, nobody in Germany even talks about what happens in Europe. There's no, not, I mean, people, even the, the, the opponents of the, the debt break never even bother to say, yeah, it's really bad for Europe. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's sort of like, it's almost the most important argument, like the, the externalities of this. It's just not even, it's not a consideration. And that is basically, you know, the reason why I'm sort of beginning to think mm, maybe this is not going to happen. Even if you, you know, look like, you know, take a hundred year horizon, uh, you know, when we come back in a hundred years, we will see. But um, um, uh, most likely not. No. Rodrigo, you have the final word? So th the only way is to create European bonds, which is politically unfeasible. Yeah. So. I find that very unlikely to happen. Um, I, yeah, exactly. It's not going to happen. So it, it doesn't even bear yeah. talking about it. Uh, but again, who is going to fight it the most? The people who benefit the most, the Germans, yeah. right? Um, and of course, the, the, the Danish who benefit by being in the euro without even having to pay for the cost of being in the euro. <laughs> it's amazing. They don't have any debt because they are the same structural problems. Okay, on that and note, we'll finish off. Thank yeah, you. I'm going to finish with applauses, yes. I like that.